Woo! Woo! The last 24 hours in crypto is pure, unadulterated drama. Drama! Drama. I'm sorry to yell, but today is crazy. I feel like I feel like this is now reality TV. This isn't even, this is like not even crypto anymore. This is the Kardashians level drama. This is TMZ drama. Today we're going deep and we're talking about a tornado that just hit the crypto ecosystem of drama, FUD, confusion. And yeah, yo, look, I'm still bullish and I'll tell you why at the end, but before we get there, I don't want you to think like this is a doom and gloom episode. It's not. I've been through crypto. I've seen the end of the world so many times. It's never that way. But wow, was the last 24 hours absolutely insane. So let's go through this. We have drama with stable coins. We have drama with DeFi. We have drama with the regulators, new rules, and potential executive actions. This is wild. It's starting to feel like FUD. Seriously, can I go higher? If you guys are excited for this one, smash the like button. I want to be clear here. You don't have to like the actual content to like the video. Just, just like the video. Okay, let's dive in. Peak FUD is approaching. It's not all mere FUD though. Some bad news is actual bad news. There is bad news here. Let's talk about it. And it's not just crypto. Look at this. If we look at the number of NASDAQ stocks cut in half, not the percentage, it perhaps better shows how much pain has been felt among investors. It's just exceeded the pandemic spike thanks to issuance of SPAC wraps. I guess all these SPACs have just gone completely down only. Uh, I'm not really a mainstream stock investor, so don't ask me about this stuff, but we can see on this chart here, it's pretty clear to see that we're approaching levels not seen since the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, as far as the number of securities down by 50% or more, pretty staggering statistic. And the Fed is unflinching right now. So who knows where this blue line will go. And I wanted to show this before I get into the meat of the episode. This is Ben Simon. He says, anyone else feeling utterly deflated after today's course of events? Almost like a nasty hurricane swept through crypto. And now we're going to be picking up the pieces for a little while. This kind of flush out definitely needed to happen, but it was not pretty to witness. This is just how crypto goes. It goes in these boom bust kind of euphoric and depressive cycles. And we're in the depressive part of it, usually. Usually when things get really, really, really depressing and sad and down and nasty is buying opportunities. I'm not saying that it's right now. Usually the depression turns to euphoria in the future. But again, let's just go through and evaluate before we get to any stuff like what comes next. So let's dive into the scandal one of this episode, which is Frog Nation. Now, many of you might be familiar with Frog Nation. I was actually one of the first people to discover Daniele and this whole Frog Nation thing as far as like the mainstream crypto content creators. Obviously, the DeFi big brains were there first, but essentially Daniele is somebody who I found and he was just on this hot streak. Everything he created, Popsicle, Time, Wonderland, Spell, it was just all this huge, huge ball of ridiculously successful FOMO and DeFi. DeFi 3.0, 2.0, whatever. Anyway, this all just came crashing down to a halt, so much so that Daniele tweeted yesterday that he received 50 death threats or life threats, depending on how you see it. And so the big question is, what happened here? How did we get to the point where Daniele went from the new god king of crypto and DeFi, literally buddy, buddy, arm over the shoulder here with Andre Cronier, the original king of DeFi, in Andre Cronier's Twitter banner, and now we get him getting death threats. So how did we get here? Let's go through this. So Frog Nation is a collective of multi-chain DeFi projects like Abracadabra, Wonderland, Popsicle Finance, and it was all scaling to new heights, and Abracadabra's innovative UST DGEN box strategy was the place to be for stablecoins. Earlier this week, Frog Nation made headlines by adding SushiSwap to its ecosystem, and Daniele Sesta vowed to clean up the struggling exchange. This was really exciting to hear that SushiSwap was joining Frog Nation, or essentially joining this cohort of DeFi applications. This sort of indicated that the ecosystem was getting even stronger and could potentially fix what was going on with Sushi. So now he's getting death threats from angry investors in the wake of revelations that Frog Nation's CFO was a co-founder of a defunct Canadian crypto exchange, Quadriga CX, which collapsed in 2019 and caused at least $190 million in investor losses. Okay, that's a different topic we're about to go into, but let's just go into this. So what is Wonderland Time, which is sort of the focal point of this collapse? 
Well, thyme is essentially an on steroids version of Olympus Dow. Now, Olympus Dow, if you've seen anyone with 3, 3 in their Twitter name or bio or whatever, that was Olympus Dow. Now, the reality is that time actually created a surcharge version of this, and people were calling that strategy 9, 9. I'm not going to spend too much time going into this, but just know that essentially the way this works is you can leverage your tokens. So you get this insanely high APY, but you need to lock your tokens and then you can borrow against them. So what it creates is leverage within this decentralized system. Now this works really well as values go up because you can keep getting more and more money for your money. When values start going down of the token, like time, what happens is you have liquidations. Meaning if I have $10 of time and I want to borrow against it and lock it up, I can borrow $3 against my time. But if the time goes down a little bit in value, it's fine. Because even if I have $6 of time in there, I've only borrowed three. The problem comes if time continues to go down in value and I still have borrowed those $3. Meaning if time gets down to the point where it's worth $3, what I borrowed, then essentially it will force sell time onto the market to replenish those funds. So it force sells. That's called getting liquidated. This is what happens when you trade leverage on things like Bybit, but it also can happen on chain. And this is one example of an on chain system that actually has liquidations. This is how a lot of DeFi works, by the way. But because time was so aggressive in the yields it could give you, it's also aggressive in the way it can collapse because as more and more people start getting liquidated, the price can rocket down, just like we've seen with liquidation cascades in the mainstream market. So while the strategy paid off handsomely in 2021 as time soared, falling prices triggered a series of cascading liquidations, which we just explained. This refers to a vicious cycle in which users' collateral is liquidated and sold into an already weak market, meaning price was going down, market's already weak, and then you get all of these forced sells pushing huge pressure on the price down, down, down. Naturally, many borrowers were liquidated on the swift 50% drop, and the Wonderland team assured investors that the so-called backing price would be defended using treasury funds. So Zero X Sifu says it looks like we finally have an opportunity to test the buyback promise of Wonderland Fi. Several million has once again been used to buy below our backing price, returning the price back to our intrinsic value. As a reminder, unlike most others, Wonderland buys at the backing price. And this is from Zero X Sifu. Remember this name for the future. He is the treasury manager, or at this time was the treasury manager of Wonderland. So back on January 25th, time plummeted to $360 from $800 in a matter of hours, well below the backing price. The buybacks didn't happen, and another cohort of borrowers were liquidated, including the founders themselves. Now, this is where the drama really pops off, because now the price had gotten so low that even the founders had gotten liquidated. Now, in response, the team announced that users who got liquidated behind them would be made whole either through buybacks, if authorized DAO, or with personal funds. You can see evidence of this from Sifu in the Discord chat. A proposal was then floated to merge Wonderland with Abracadabra, citing operational synergies. Remember, Abracadabra is the spell ecosystem and Wonderland is the time ecosystem. It called for a buyout of the Wonderland treasury through a token swap of time slash memo for 98 billion spell. Don't even worry about any of this. Just know they tried to buy out. They surfaced a buyout opportunity, but this one did not go through. It was not well received. So this is where things started to get even crazier, right? Because there wasn't this buyout that was promised below that number, below that line, as Chamath would say. So investors have now started to get scared that MIM, Abracadabra Stablecoin, which is in this frog nation world, is potentially at risk. And though MIM did not lose its peg for any meaningful amount of time, it's now currently at a dollar and it's pegged at a dollar. The MIM curve pool, which is where a lot of this trading happens, is on CRV curve. The MIM pool where people were swapping between USDT and Tether and DAI, as well as MIM, this is how I trade stable coins. This is how many people trade stable coins. When you're talking about big amounts of stable coins, you go to curve. Curve has all of the tools you need to trade these stable coins and do it with very low slippage. If I have a million dollars in USDC, I don't want to trade into $900,000 of USDT. They're both stable coins, just convert me without any slippage. And while currently it's not possible to do that with zero slippage, uh, Curve does the best job of getting from stable coin to stable coin. But what you want to see is good amounts and a good balance between the stable coins. So as you can see at the beginning of this whole event, MIM was half the stable coin pool and three CRV, which is DAI, USDC, and Tether was the other half. So you had a pool made up of half MIM, 
and half of pretty much the most reliable stable coins in the ecosystem. So it's very healthy. It's very easy to get between them. And there's no doubt that if I have MIM in that pool, I can easily withdraw to get myself some USDC and be in the good stable coin, if you will. But this changed wildly and dramatically. And as you can see, the total reserves here have gone from almost 2.7 billion down to 0.7 billion. And it's almost exclusively MIM with very little USDC, USDT, and DAI in there. Let's get down here and talk about what happened with MIM, the stablecoin. Because as we know, if stablecoins don't remain stable, that's like the ground shifting below you in crypto. It's very, very scary. So a lot of people were worried, like, should I get out of MIM immediately? And to be honest, I was actually farming a fair amount of MIM in the pool on Convex Finance. And when all this started popping off, I just withdrew from Convex Finance and put it back into USDC. I didn't cover that move in a big way because I was still digesting all the information and I didn't want to be raising sort of false flags because I really wasn't that closely, intimately acquainted with the facts. I also never advocated for people to farm with MIM or to do anything with MIM on my channel, so I didn't think it was directly relevant to my audience. However, I did take my MIM and put it back into USDC, and apparently I did this before a major wave of people did this. Because what happened was, apparently FTX did the exact same thing, which is a pretty logical move. But people are saying that this was pretty predatory. He's saying that these guys are predatory and they need to stop trusting sexes and the Ponzi's that they are dumping on us, they are a net negative to the crypto space. I don't know about all that, but effectively FTX removed all their liquidity, something like half a billion dollars from the mempool, and that's what really set off these alarm bells. Uh, this tweeter is saying he had zero skin in the game. He doesn't hold any meaningful stable position. He's just tired of seeing exchanges slaughter retail, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so what we know is what happened after this is that the mempool on Curve got drained. So the explanation for how these two things happen, how you went from 2.7 billion down to 0.7 billion, a lot of that was FTX and Alameda removing their liquidity, which to be fair, they have every right to do. I get why the complaints are there, but if you have half a billion and a scandal is popping off, I think removing liquidity is fair. I don't know. You guys tell me in the comment section below whether that was predatory or fair. I don't think you can blame FTX for what's going on with Wonderland. But now let's get to the drama drama, which is that apparently Sifu, 0x Sifu, is actually the co-founder of Quadriga CX, which led to the loss of hundreds of millions of dollars, 169, 70, 80, 90 million, who knows, the number has been quoted differently in different sources, but a lot of money was lost in this Canadian exchange shutting down. Zach XBT is talking about here that if you're unfamiliar with the Canadian exchange that collapsed in 2019, he has confirmed with Daniele over private messages here, you can see screenshots, that this is in fact him. So prior to Quadriga, Michael helped run an identity theft ring called Shadow Crew, in which he later pled guilty to. While Daniele insists it's fine, he puts both his reputation on the line, along with most importantly, the money that people have deposited in his protocols at risk. He would never have expected this, but he cannot sit on this any longer after the events experienced earlier this week with time. Quadriga ties back to Sifu. So there are these threads here that essentially show that Daniele has some knowledge that Sifu might actually be this person, a founder of Quadriga CX, and that this is potentially a very bad actor with control over the treasury. Let's dig into this even more. And I just want to be clear, like I didn't do any of this research. This is secondary research. I'm just reading tweets on the internet. This is all alleged, alleged so I don't know the truth or fiction of this stuff. I'm just sharing the drama as I understand it, as I've internalized it, and I don't know, get some popcorn or something. Anyway, so who is Sifu? Michael Petrin, aka Omar Danani. He says he's had the unfortunate pleasure of following, and he is Midas the Fool again. I don't know who this is. He says he's had the unfortunate pleasure of following this criminal for years and a thread on why we need this guy out. So currently affiliated with Wonderland Phi as the CFO of the multi-sig with $800 million in the treasury, his wallet expanded from $45 million to $450 million and is currently funneling out the funds now that Sifu has been ousted as his real identity. So in 2018, 2019, he was, quote, Michael Patron. Him and now missing deceased co-founder General Cotton started Quadriga CX, a Canadian crypto exchange. They basically ran a Ponzi with on-chain evidence showing that Cotton may have traded with users' funds. I have no evidence of this. Again, alleged, alleged, caveat, caveat. Lawyers, okay, okay, I don't know. This is just what I'm reading. And this is, of course, part of the mystery. We all know that that exchange went down and that guy died with all this money in a wallet that nobody had access to. Lots of huge mystery and questions around it. Anyway, 
They would use deposits from new users to pay the withdrawals of old users. Eventually, everyone's withdrawals would be stuck in the process for weeks until eventually Cotton went on a trip to India. Mysteriously, Cotton died on his trip to Crohn's. Many believe that his death was faked with weird details around the insurance of his death certificate, wife's reaction, etc. Many don't buy that he died. Many Canadians lost their life savings, some six figures worth or more. The courts tried to reclaim what they could, but most of the money was gone or missing. Sifu seemed to get away great. He and his wife ended up with the majority of the assets. His co-founder Cotton was gone with him and $170 million. Canadians left helpless, but Sifu laughing all the way to the bank, his funds were safe. Before that, in 2005, he was running an identity theft ring, literally part of an online criminal media mafia committed to credit card theft, ID theft, and other Ponzi schemes. His name was Omar Danani back then. They called it shadowcrew.com, and Omar was arrested as part of six others in the United States. He did time for the stunt, but soon after went to Canada and changed his name again. This time around where he made a mistake and registered various companies under his new moniker, Michael T Patron, but did so along his relative, Nazim Danini. It didn't take long for journalists to connect those dots. Classy guy, Omar Danani used the alias Voler, French for thief, during his time with Shadow Crew. And in between, he still had time to be part of processing anonymous purchases of the earliest digital currencies. It's not the crypto we know today. This was full of money laundering, child pornography, criminal activities, but most of all, Omar didn't care. He's there just collecting the payments and making his quick buck. He also ran another Ponzi called Midas Gold, basically took others' money and didn't give it back. The guy has been around since 2002, before most of you were even here, of course, because <laughs> crypto wasn't even here. I've seen him post in forums and I knew the vile acts he's capable of. These are just the things he's been caught for. I've always wondered where this piece of trash went next. Glad we found him. Gives our entire industry a terrible rep as he's destroyed people's financial well-being. To know he made off with 450 million breaks my heart. Update. Zero X Sifu removed from position. And in came the memes. Instead of Frog Nation, which is what everyone was calling it, now they're calling it Rug Nation. We have people saying short Ponzi's and long real SHIT on capitulation dip. We have people saying Maker doesn't seem like such a boomer project now, does it? And of course, this is because the very low yield yields coming out of Anchor. People just didn't desire this boring low APY protocol. Same with Compound and these other DeFi 1.0 projects that got left in the dust when DeFi 2.0 and extreme yield and degenerate leverage became absolutely the norm here in DeFi land because who's getting out of bed for a 2%, 3% yield when you could potentially make 200x tomorrow on the next big you know, NFT or altcoin. And then of course, if you're going to stake your money, you need at least double digit yields to make it worth your while. So this is where, of course, the boomerism uh, towards DeFi 1.0 and that culture began. But now, of course, people saying, okay, well, maybe that was actually pretty sensible. We should have stuck with these sensible projects. And people are saying, I hope the tide is shifting away from chasing the most degen stuff back to sustainable DeFi with the recent saga. And of course, we get this saying from Danger. We know that Aave Protocol V3 is launched on Testnet. Maybe this is a sign of the times, a return back to sort of home base here for Aave. And Testin Prodcap is saying, with all the MIM drama, we kind of missed that there was a hack of $80 million on the Quibit finance bridge to BSC. This was the largest exploit so far of 2022. And we're so busy with the Wonderland Time Sifu Quadriga CX thing that we didn't even notice an $80 million hack. Wow. Insult to injury, drama, theft, impersonation, tainting and scarring our precious crypto industry. This is bad stuff. This is really bad stuff. And you know what's even crazy? It's after all this drama, we got two more pieces of drama. So going back to Ben over here saying that it feels like a tornado just hit us and we're picking up the pieces and will be for a while. This is why we have the Fed rugging us. We have Wonderland rugging us. We have bridges rugging us. And now we have some shady White House executive order on crypto that we don't know really what the context of, but we can guess is something to do with stable coins. It's all just so conveniently timed to the point where you might have to scratch your beard and say, how could this happen all in the same moment at the same time? Again, when everything seems a bit too convenient, maybe it is. Then again, having really degenerate APYs in a down market is a serious recipe for cascading liquidations. We'll talk about that at the end. And finally, for one more piece of fun, we have this new rule coming out of the SEC, which is to amend the ATS regulation. Now, this is being considered a ridiculously wide and overly broad amendment that is directly targeting the digital asset space. And Laura Shin here highlights Hester Pierce, who is the one crypto-friendly SEC commissioner, who said in her visceral dissent, 
content. We face no emergency in these markets that compel us to limit comments to 30 days. Indeed, the commission's precipitous rush to plow through the comment period, almost as if it were a mere formality in our process, presents a greater immediate risk to the market than any of the issues that have led to this recommendation. So effectively, we get Time Wonderland completely crumbling. We get allegations of a criminal running the time treasury. We have the Fed pressures in the monetary policy. We have Biden's executive action, and now we have an SEC rule change, all of which it just feels like a mountain, like the Mount Everest of news, of bad news, is on top of us. And yet Bitcoin's up slightly from the lows. So does this mean we've just been like horrifically and disgustingly oversold and that we need to bounce and that until we get an actual rate hike that you know the worst is over i certainly feel that way uh we'll talk a little bit now about some positives because there are positives always positives we have alex kruger saying prepare for a range similar from june to july where the odds of breaking up or down are similar and the upside is limited everything crashed hard in january yet powell said today asset prices are somewhat elevated the strike for the fed put is far away meaning the fed isn't coming to save us not this time. We have Luke Martin saying the bear market is transitory. Come on, Jerome, where are you talking about the transitoriness and nature of bear markets? We also got Pomp talking about a bill in Arizona to make Bitcoin legal tender within the state. I really don't know if states have the ability to create legal tender. I certainly don't think so. Uh, however, this is a cute thing to see. It just shows, again, not all jurisdictions, not all regulators, not all places are against crypto or trying to put this thing into a dark corner. A lot of places are very crypto friendly. A lot of regulators are very crypto friendly. We also have Google Cloud could soon accept Bitcoin and crypto after launching its blockchain unit. We have MasterCard saying it wants to increase Ethereum scalability via consensus. And then we have AKT listing on Cosmos. So a little bit of nice news here. Again, I'm a big AKT fan. I think that their tech is very cool, but that's not the point of today's episode. Woo, a marathon, a marathon of drama. I'm literally up here pacing back and forth. I can't sit still on days like today. And it just feels like we just got hit in the face so hard. So many things all at once. And I don't really smell a conspiracy here. So much is just the feeling that when things get this bad, when things feel this bad, like there's literally no blue in the sky, just clouds for miles. Usually that gets us close to a bottom of sorts, a local bottom, some kind of sentiment overextension where we can't get any worse. The reality is, is that I believe so strongly in the adoption of this technology, regardless of what Biden wants to do, regardless of what anyone wants to do, regardless of criminals doing bad things in the ecosystem system. Yes, being overly degenerate with DeFi yields is probably pretty scary. In fact, DeFi is a scary place right now and probably best to be away from any kind of exotic DeFi, at least until the seas settle down a little bit. Secondly, I'm also completely obsessed, entrenched, and through and through a believer in the metaverse gaming revolution. This is happening regardless of anything that we've just talked about. It's happening. It is a product category that doesn't need orange coin, that doesn't need any of this. It's just about people having fun, playing games online, and sharing the value of these economies. Very simple. It doesn't require anything else from this world. And that actually gives me life and gives me hope because I believe this year we'll see the launch and growth of the most important gaming and metaverse projects to date. And that without fail, these crashes and these horribly low sentiment periods will be looked at as well, amazing opportunities at some point in the future. So my task remains the same. Of course, NFTs have been on this massive, disgusting, amazing, bullish tear. And I'm so excited for the next few weeks and months of NFTs as they seem to be just sitting out there in the corner, not getting affected by this. Again, if the whole world comes crumbling down, I'm sure the NFT market will be affected. But at the same time, it's just nice that there's a place where we can go and bury our heads and just trade JPEGs and have fun, make some profits, play some games. And that's what I'll be doing throughout 2022. In fact, I'm going to start doing some gameplay videos here on the channel. I feel like it could mix up the content and make it even more fun and even more accessible to a lot of people. I hope you guys enjoyed this TMZ style episode on the drama. To anyone out there affected by this, you're not alone. We'll get through this together as a community. If you guys enjoyed learning about all this drama, the crazy amount of drama, smash that like button. You don't have to like the drama to like the video. If you like the video, like the video. As always, I'm Elio Trades. You can find me on Twitter at Elio Trades. Yes, there is so much good happening in 2022. The prices seem scary. The regulators seem like they have their fangs out, but it's not gonna stop this train and I'll be with you here each and every day, each and every step. As always, I hope you guys are having a happy and healthy day. I hope you're okay wherever you are in the world. And as always, I will see you very soon on the next episode.